Hallelujah. Well, welcome, and this is Andrew Shreve, and uh, welcome to another session. This one is called uh, Freedom from Evil, and you'll be able to read this teaching if you go to my website, andrewshreve.org, click on Partner Letters, and go to May 2012. Hallelujah. So, I'm here in Byron Bay, New South Wales, Australia, and it's the middle of winter, but it's a very beautiful day, and uh, you should come here sometime. I think you <laughs> You'll enjoy it. It's a great place. Hallelujah. So, you know, normally you think of uh, evil in the, in the sense of murder or some other horrific crime. But I'm going to talk about evil today or freedom from evil uh, in, a, in a way maybe you haven't thought of it before. So I hope you find this uh, teaching interesting. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, The love of money is the root of all evil. And then in Hebrews 3.12, and these are our two texts, it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 states, The love of money is the root of all evil. But we need to look at the context. And so Paul is talking about godly doctrine in, uh, in verse 3 of that chapter. Paul the Apostle refers to certain men who are proud, have corrupt minds, destitute of the truth. These corrupt men suppose that financial gain is godliness or holiness. So in other words, there's people that were preaching or teaching that that if you have money, that means you're godly or more godly than people that don't have money. Okay? If you have wealth, financial gain is godliness. They suppose that financial gain is godliness. A gain is godliness. That's what they're teaching. So, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it promises financial provision for those who seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Matthew 6.33 says that. But the financial blessing contained in the, within the gospel is very different to saying that wealth equals godliness. So, applied godly knowledge and faith can bring material blessing. But that does not therefore say that those who have wealth are godly. Wealth can be attained in numerous ways and not all those ways are godly. In other words, like someone can be god someone could have wealth, but it doesn't mean they're godly. They could have got that wealth from all sorts of ways. So even though the gospel does promise financial blessing for those who have accurate knowledge and faith, etc. That doesn't mean that the people that have financial blessing are necessarily godly. They could have got that wealth in a different way. Okay? And also doesn't mean that people that don't have wealth are not godly. Okay? Just that someone can be very godly, but maybe they're not understanding uh, some aspects of, of, of the, the gospel. Maybe circumstances are such that, that uh, no one's perfect in life. You know? Maybe circumstances are such that they lost all their wealth or or they're in a prison, or, or something like that. So they could be very godly people who have no money, or very poor. Okay. So the truth is that financial gain is neutral. It does not indicate godliness, nor does it indicate ungodliness. Wealthy people can be godly or ungodly. Conversely, poor people can be godly or ungodly. As wealth is not an indicator of godliness, we are instructed, in verse 5, to withdraw ourselves from those who equate financial gain to godliness. Scripture teaches that it is a serious error to imply that wealthy people are godlier than poor people. Paul then discusses the idea of contentment and wealth and examines them in the light of eternity. We come into the world with nothing and we can, cannot take anything with us when we leave. That's verse 7. If we have food and clothes, we should be content. Verse 8. If our basic needs are met, which is what Jesus promised us in Matthew 6.33, food and raiment, and we can be godly with contentment, this is great gain. Verse 6. In other words, if, if you have your basic needs met, your food, your clothes, your shelter, right? so you, you're fed and you're warm, you're protected, and you can be content and godly in that situation, that's, that's, a, that's great gain. That's a great achievement. Okay? You don't have to have masses of wealth to be content or to prove that you're godly. 
Paul then addresses the pursuit or priority of our lives. If the main focus of our lives is the pursuit of the accumulation of wealth, if that's the main focus of our lives, we inevitably fall into temptation, a snare, lusts, destruction and perdition, verse 9. So it's clear that the acquiring of wealth should not be the primary focus of our lives. Jesus taught similarly in Matthew 6.24 when he, when he said that mammon or avarice and God were competing masters and we must choose who we will serve as our first priority. And he talks about that extensively in Matthew 6.19-33. So in other words, Jesus is saying you've got to choose. Who, who are you going to put first? Money first or God first? And clearly the answer is God. The discussion of the concepts of wealth godliness, contentment and priority are the context for the statement for the love of money is the root of all evil, verse 10. Now the Greek word, uh, forgive my pronunciation, but uh, pilaguaria is translated love of money. That's one word is translated love of money, one Greek word. And this word means avarice, according to the Strong's Dictionary. Now avarice, according to Webster's, means an inordinate desire of gaining and possessing wealth, covetousness, greediness, or insatiable desire of gain. So that's what the love of money is. It's, it's, uh, this word means someone who um, has an inordinate desire, an abnormal desire, or too, high, too strong a desire for wealth, gaining and possessing wealth. They're covetous. They're coveting other people's money. They're greedy. They've got an insatiable desire for gain. That's what avarice is. That's the love. That's what he's talking about when he's talking about the love of money. And the Greek word kakos, translated evil, means worthless, depraved, injurious, bad, evil, harm, ill, noisome, and wicked. So this inordinate desire is the root of all that is bad or evil. So the root of all that is evil and depraved comes from greediness, covetousness, and an excessive or extravagant desire to possess wealth. The love of money, therefore, addresses our heart attitude and the degree of our desire for wealth. It's not so much addressing our level of wealth, but our focus to increase or maintain our wealth. For example, Bill may only have $100, right? so he's a poor man relatively, but he has an, he has an inordinate desire to increase his wealth to $200. Bill's greedily coveting after other people's money to increase his wealth. So here we see Bill is poor, yet he's guilty of avarice or the love of money. Conversely, Mike, another example, may have a million dollars and have a desire to increase his wealth to two million dollars. However, Mike's desire to go from one million to two million is not inordinate, excessive or insatiable. He's sort of relaxed about the whole thing. He's not greedy or covetous of other people's money. Mike's desire to increase his wealth is balanced and for godly reasons. Maybe he wants to use that money to expand a business or, or, or to, to bless people or whatever. It's, so Mike is not guilty of avarice. The love of money, therefore, affects people at all levels of the wealth spectrum, not just the rich. So, in fact, it could often be that the, the people that are poorer have more of the love of money than the people that are rich because when people have a lot of money sometimes, money's not an issue to them much more. I mean, some people it is. So when you think of the love of money as a root of all evil, don't just equate that to rich people. That can be to poor people struggling on a mortgage, struggling just to, 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 to uh, make ends meet. These people, or even people in deep poverty, could, have, could be more guilty of avarice than someone that, that has plenty of money. Okay? Of course, we do have those very, very wealthy people that are also guilty of avarice and want to extend their wealth massively, right? So, we all have legitimate desires to enjoy the basic financial provisions needed for a reasonable life. Okay, That's normal. We want to have a reasonable life. Basic financial provisions would include, and I think this is from Scripture as well, not having any debt, to be debt-free, ownership of a house and car, so you've got control over your, your house, your, where you live, and control over your transportation, the, the ability to provide a private education for our children, because... These days, some of the teaching and emphasis in the public school system is very ungodly. For example, that we were not created by God in His likeness, but rather we've evolved from animals or fish. Well, that's a terrible thing to tell, tell your kids. You know, so I wouldn't want to send my kids to a school that taught that. 
Um, family holidays, I think that's just normal every year, a couple of weeks or whatever. Daily, good, healthy, nutritious food, that's just a normal requirement of life. Nice clothes, you don't want to have to dress like a, like a beggar. And some savings in the bank. The Bible says your storehouse will be blessed. That's just what I would call normal or you know, what a normal desire to have those things. And the, also the ability to be a financial blessing to others. If, however, we look at the basics, which I've just outlined, we see that many of us cannot even afford the basic cost of a reasonable life. And I'm in that situation at this moment. I don't have my own house, you know, debt-free. So, but I'm content with the food and clothes, but I'm not in that position that I would even consider to be, to be normal. Okay? Many people, therefore, due to their financial scarcity, are vulnerable to falling into the temptation of the love of money. Okay? Because of scarcity. There's a temptation there. It's not just, however, needy people who are vulnerable. Wealthy people who, whose basic needs are easily provided for can also fall into the temptation of avarice as they may inordinately, inordinately desire more wealth so they can experience greater power and prestige. So the Greek, that Greek word, pelagiaria, implies being unbalanced or excessive, to be morally corrupted by greed and covetousness with an overemphasis to attain riches and an inability to be content with one's present financial position. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul gives the following warning to the man of God. Those who long for, covet and excessively desire wealth have been led astray, erred or seduced from the true Christian faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Verse 10. The man of God is to flee this excessive desire for wealth and rather follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience and meekness. Verse 11. In other words, the right priority for our lives should not be financial or the first priority, rather, of our life should not be financial and the accumulation of riches. Rather, our first priority and pursuit should be to be right with God. And this comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. To live a godly life. To be full of faith. And I preach a lot about meditation of God's promises. That brings faith. To always act with a motive of love and to be patient and gentle. Okay? So that should be our first priority in life. And sometimes, you know, the allure of money could cause you to act out of love or could cause you to, uh, to not live a godly life, to do some form, form of corruption. Well, that would be avarice, wouldn't it? Because you're putting money ahead of what we know is the right priority. So this teaching is especially relevant to the preacher and teacher of God's word. The man of God should not teach from the following motives. I'm talking about preachers, right? Pastors and ministers. To get wealth. To covet people's money, to be popular, to be aligned with contemporary thought if that thought is unscriptural, and to be politically correct. These ministries, with these emphasis, may receive more money, they might be look, look successful, but the man of God should rather teach what is true to Scripture, even if it means persecution, loss of followers, and less money. Similarly, the man of God should not covet in his heart the money of the people he's ministering to. Now, I think a lot of pastors and preachers are guilty of that. They're preaching for the offering. <laughs> Their motive is, I want to get that money from those people. That's not right. That's covetousness. Shouldn't have a heart of covetousness. And they shouldn't be preaching in the place where they think they receive the most money. That's also corruption and akin to the sin of Balaam. Look in Second uh, Peter 2.15. Balaam you know, basically preached for money, preached for reward. That's not, not right. Okay. So rather, the man of God should preach where he believes the Lord is leading him by the Holy Spirit, regardless of the financial outcome. So he should be pure in his heart, not have financial motives for his ministry. So our second scripture is, is Hebrews 3.12. Right? Here an unbelieving heart is described as being evil. The Greek word translated evil is poneros, which means hurtful, evil, calamitous, ill, Disease, culpable, derelict, vicious, mischief, malice, grief, devil, bad, grievous, lewd, and wickedness. That's pretty bad. So to avoid being evil, we need to ensure our hearts are not unbelieving. Okay? We need to fill our hearts with God's promises. As Romans 10.17 says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. So 
an evil heart of unbelief. So if you're equal and not believing God's word, that's, that's called evil. I think most of us don't realize that. So let us now link the two scriptures together. 1 Timothy 6.10, Hebrews 3.12. Both talk about evil. One about the excessive desire for wealth being the root of all evil. And the second describing belief, unbelief as an evil heart. But interestingly, both are connected to time. It takes time to make money and it takes time to meditate God's word to ensure our hearts are not in unbelief. If we give God first place and spend time meditating in His Word, ensuring our hearts are filled with faith, that means we're going to have less time to make money. So there's clearly a competition for our time with regards to the creating of wealth and the creating of faith in our hearts. We must choose which master to serve, God, who is the Word of God, or money. Okay, and some references there in the, in the text as you read it. So what's the strategy? What can we do to ensure we are free from the evils of the love of money and unbelief in God's Word? Firstly, we need to put God first through giving God's Word the first place in our lives. We need to free our heart from the fear of running out of money. We do this by filling our heart with faith through the process of meditation of God's promises of financial provision. When our hearts are filled with faith, we will be less likely to succumb to the evil excessive desire to accumulate wealth and also free from the evil heart of unbelief. If we truly believe God will financially provide for us every day for the rest of our lives, I mean, if you believe that, that financial provision is not a problem, we may be less inclined to feel the need to give our first priority to the accumulation of wealth. Imagine if you believe that God was going to supply you. Why do you have to focus first on wealth? You could focus first on other things like godliness, like love. Isn't one of the reasons why we may give our first priority to the accumulation of wealth linked to the fear of possibly running out of money in the future? In this teaching, I'm not suggesting it's wrong to be wealthy. The Bible clearly says in Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. And Deuteronomy 8, 18 says, God giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. There is clearly a connection between wealth and the expansion of the Lord's kingdom or covenant. God obviously therefore wants his people financially wealthy so they can give towards the expansion and establishment of his kingdom. In addition, God wants us financially blessed so we can ad adequately provide for our families and be a financial blessing to the poor and misfortunate. This is understood through Jesus' teaching of the Samaritan who aided the man who was robbed and beaten. You can read that in Luke 10, 30-37. How much money did the Samaritan need to pay for the medical and hotel expenses of the robbed and beaten man? If the Samaritan man was not financially blessed, he would have not been able to provide the godly assistance which Jesus advocates through his teaching. So God wants us to have money, right? Don't get me wrong on this. In this issue, we are dealing with the priority and motives of our hearts. Priority and motive. Around the subject of wealth. Our first priority in life must always be our service to God, to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit in our heart and not the accumulation of wealth. In other words, first priority, yes, by all means let us make money, but first priority is not is the Holy Spirit. First priority must be God. First priority must be, Lord, what do you want me to do? If you want me to not work in that job, I won't work there. Just follow the Holy Spirit first. Don't put money as your first priority. We also need to ensure our hearts are pure, trusting in the covenant of God for our provision and learn to be content with the simple provisions of food, clothes and shelter. In other words, we need a pure heart. We need to be trusting in God for our provision, not fearful and using our own effort to, to because they're out of fear to try to bring the money in. And then whatever we have, as long as we have food and clothes and shelter, we should be content with that simple provision doesn't matter if we're very, very wealthy or not. If we can trust and delight in God's promises of daily financial provision, we'll be less inclined to fall for the manifold temptations, temptations linked to the inordinate desire to attain and accumulate wealth and divert the pr priority of our hearts away from a pure service to God to the primary pursuit of wealth. In conclusion, the world is constantly pressuring us not just to be able to afford the financial basics, but to increase our financial prestige through increased wealth. Life can easily become pressurized, 
busy and demanding. And in this pressure, God can be pushed to one side despite our honest intentions to love Him. To avoid this pitfall, I recommend periodically restructuring our priorities to incorporate some disciplines which give God opportunity to speak into our lives. These disciplines may help us from going down the evil paths of avarice and unbelief. In other words, the world is pressuring us. Everyone's pressure, there's financial pressure on you, right? So you need to periodically just put some, put some priorities in place which put God first so that you won't get caught up in this treadmill, if you like, of, of um, the rat race and of making money. Okay? You need to stop periodically, make some new priorities, put God first. So discipline, this is what I recommend. Give God your best hour every day. Okay, Block out an hour of your time each day for an appointment with God. This should be the time you are most fresh and alert. Make this time available for communication with the Lord. This will include praise and worship, thanksgiving, prayer in tongues and in your language, Bible reading, meditation of selected scriptures and promises and listening to God. In addition, Give God some quality time one day each week. That's your rest day, right? We all should have a rest day. This is a day to rest and spend some uninterrupted time with your Lord. Possibly walk in the nature with God. Okay, so there's two things. One hour a day, give to God. And then one day a week, spend some quality time with the Lord on your rest day. Okay, that's not a big commitment. It's a small commitment. But it's a priority, it's a habit you can form into your life, which will help you from getting off on the wrong path. So you might say, I don't have time to give God an extra hour each day <laughs> and quality time on a rest day each week. You're saying, like, I'm, I'm flat out right now. Don't you, can't you understand me? Okay. The truth is, we need these times of fellowship and communion with our Creator. If we are too busy to give the Lord our first priority, then we're too busy. And we need to make some changes to our life. In other words, no excuse. If you're in that situation, then you're too busy. Your life's not right. You're not balanced. Remember this though. Whatever we honor the Lord with, the Lord will honor us with. And the Lord always multiplies His blessing back to us. When we give God extra time, we find that He will give us extra time. So you can see that in 1 Samuel 2.30. You know, I remember years ago, I gave, uh, I decided to do this. And I put God first in my life and made time for God, cut some other things out of my life, made time for God. And now, I'm quite honestly, I have lots of time for God. You know, and, and I've proven it. <laughs> and it's great. It's far better. Okay, so make that change. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for warning me about the twofold evils of avarice and unbelief. I desire to be free from these evils. Thank you that meditation of your promises in the area of financial provision will assist me to be free from avarice and unbelief as faith will come to my heart and I'll be able to trust you for my daily financial provision. This trust in your will and ability to provide for me financially will free me from the temptation to place the accumulation of wealth as a higher priority than my pure service to the leading of your Holy Spirit. Please strengthen us this day, Lord, to meditate your financial promises daily, to ensure our hearts are free from the evils of avarice and unbelief. Lord, let the anointing of your Holy Spirit come upon your people, Lord, so they can get the right priorities in their life. They can be content, learn to be content, with the simple provisions of food, clothes and shelter, Lord, and not place wealth in a higher priority than you. Father, I pray, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Bless you. I love you and look forward to talking to you again soon.